والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى اله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنتي ليوم الدين all praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day this is the first in our series this week of uh, studies in hadith, hadith literature, the science of hadith referred to as ulum al-hadith and uh, we will be looking at a number of different topics uh, related to hadith and the science as a second step from what was covered on the second level of our uh, intensive courses uh, which we began a year ago last summer summer of uh, 2000 at that time we did an introduction to the science of hadith now we're continuing on with further detail of course some of you were not present in the first course so of necessity some of the points will have to be uh, reviewed the science or the science of hadith based on the, the term hadith itself an Arabic term which basically means an item of news, conversation, a tale, a story or a report, whether historical or legendary, whether true or false, relating to the past or the present. This is the general meaning uh, linguistically. However, in the same way that other words prior to the final revelation changed meaning in Arabic, like words like zakah, salah, these had other meanings prior to the prophethood. And it was with the prophethood that these uh, words took on new meanings, the meanings that we know now. Similarly, the term hadith took on a particular meaning uh, with the uh, development of Islam. Now, we find the term hadith used in both the Quran and the Sunnah. And it has been used to mean uh, the same general usages linguistically as in uh, Surah Al-Qalam verse 44 we have Allah saying there then leave me alone with those who reject this communication and the term used here فَذَرْنِي وَمَنْ يُكَذِّبُ بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ the term hadith is used there and it's taken to mean communication and this obviously it's referring here to the Quran and we find uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu also saying inna ahsan al hadithi kitabullah indeed the best form of communication is the book of Allah so this term hadith has been used to refer to uh, religious uh, communication in particular the Quran itself has been used also to refer to a historical story. We can find that in Surah Taha, the 20th chapter, verse 9. وَهَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Where Allah says there, has the story of Moses reached you? And we find Prophet Muhammad also saying, حَدِّثُوا عَنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ وَلَا حَرَجْ You may speak about the children of Israel without any harm that is speaking about uh, information 
uh, concerning their history, etc., etc. Not necessarily speaking ill of them. The third uh, category, a general conversation. When the Prophet Muhammad confided in one of his wives, this is mentioned in Surah Tahrim, at Tahrim verse 3. وَإِذَا أَسَرَّ النَّبِيُّ إِلَىٰ بَعْضِ أَزْوَاجِهِ حَدِيثًا So it's used speaking about a general conversation. And we find Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying مَنْ اِسْتَمَعْ إِلَىٰ حَدِيثِ قَوْمٍ وَهُمْ لَهُ كَارِهُونَ أَوْ يَفِرُّونَ مِنْهُ يُصَبُّ فِي أُذُنِهِ الْأَنَكِ Molten copper will be poured in the air of whoever eavesdrops on the conversation of people who dislike him doing so or flee from him. So the linguistic understanding of the term hadith can be found in both the Quran and in hadith literature. However, what this term came to mean was whatever is transmitted from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of his acts, his sayings, his tacit approvals, or his physical characteristics. All of this is refer referred to as all of it is referred to as hadith. Scholars of Islamic law who use the term hadith, they do not include in it the physical appearance of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Because they are looking at the, what the Prophet Sallallahu conveyed from a legal point of view, its relevance in terms of our practice and application to our lives. Now, when we look at hadith uh, as to its importance uh, in Islam, some of these concepts have already been dis developed in our study of tafsir. When we studied tafsir, we found that the Quran uh, depended on the sunnah for clarification and for explanation. But first and foremost, the main point with regards to relevance of hadith is that hadith is a form of revelation. This is the first and foremost most important point. That it's not acts or explanations or approvals which were done from the Prophet Muhammad's personal uh, feelings and judgments. Although some of that did exist, in general, what the Prophet instructed, what he approved, which has to do with the religion, this was based on revelation. And in Surah Najm, 53rd chapter, verses 3 and 4, we find Allah making this point, saying, وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَىٰ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He, Muhammad وسلم, does not speak of his desires. Indeed, what he says is revelation. So we then consider the hadith as a primary source of guidance similar to the Quran, the Quran being the revealed word of Allah, this is revelation coming to us. The, sun, the hadith represents another source of revelation which was conveyed to us. And we should not, as I mentioned before in terms of understanding the Qur'an, we should not separate the hadith from it. This source of guidance, which is the hadith, we can find Prophet Muhammad stressing its importance along with the Qur'an in a well-known statement of his in which he said, Indeed, I was given the Qur'an and something similar to it along with it. That's what the Prophet got of the Quran 
was not to be looked at in isolation. But there was something else which he was given, which was revelation, which was expressed in the form of hadith. The things which he said, which he uh, did, and the things which he approved, things which were done in his presence. The second uh, importance of hadith in the system of Islam is to the Quran itself, which we spoke about at great length when we dealt in our level on studies in tafsir. But I'll just touch it here briefly. In that the sunnah preserved, or the hadith, and we look at the difference between hadith and sunnah, these are used sort of interchangeably, so sometimes they may slip out to hear me saying sunnah when I'm speaking about hadith in specific. I will go on to look at sunnah and hadith. But anyway, the uh, protection of the Quran, when Allah said that He revealed the Quran and He would protect it, He did not only protect it from the point of view of protecting its text, the physical text. Yes, that was preserved, preserved in writing as well as in uh, the hearts of the believers. It was preserved in both forms. However, that protection was not restricted to the physical protection of the Quran because had it been only that, the meanings of the Quran could then have easily been distorted. We have other systems in which people uh, have books, the Bible, the Torah, the books of other religions, whether it's the Gita or whatever, and there are no end of interpretations and explanations. Every scholar, every individual can put in it meanings. And of course, who is to say which one is the right one and which one is the wrong one? Whereas in the case of the Quran, because it was to be the final revelation of Allah to humankind, then Allah preserved not only its text to remain an evidence, a miracle of Prophet Muhammad which would stand until the last day, but He also preserved its meanings to ensure that people would understand correctly what Allah had revealed. And that preservation took place in the Sunnah. This is why we find in Surah An-Nahl, 16th chapter, verse 44, we find Allah there saying, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ And I revealed to you the reminder that is the Qur'an, in order that you explain to the people what was revealed to them. The Qur'an was revealed for, for their benefit, primarily, Prophet Muhammad being a conveyor of the Qur'an. But he was given the responsibility of clarifying the instructions of the Qur'an, giving further details to descriptions or explanations which Allah gave in the Qur'an. So where Allah tells us to establish the prayer, aqim is salah li dhikri, establish the prayer for my remembrance. It was the Prophet Muhammad sunnah, where he said, sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli, pray as you saw me pray. And he demonstrated the prayer to his companions, you know, uh, clarifying how prayer should take place. And that of course takes precedence over any uh, rational uh, interpretations in that one may say the Prophet uh, was instructing the men to pray as he prayed. However, the case of women is different. You know, women are obliged to cover themselves up more than men. Therefore, the prayer of the woman should be different from the prayer of the man. So if the, the man, when he stands, you know, he raises his hand and he places his hand uh, across his uh, chest, the lower part of his chest or whatever, they are saying, no, the woman should place her hands on the upper part of the chest. And if she bows, she doesn't bow like the man who bows 
you know, uh, at the 45 degree angle, or right, 90 degree angle, sorry, it's 90 degree. No, she should only bow like 45 degrees from straight, she should only go 45 degrees here, you know. Why? Because if she bowed all the way, this full 90 degrees, then, you know, her posterior would be protruding, you know, and that she is supposed to cover herself, right? So she is told to not bend completely and just to touch her knees with her fingertips. And if she goes into prostration, similarly, uh, her prostration should not be like the man's where he goes down and his behind is up in the air. You know, they say, no, it's not, it's not appropriate for women. So they say, no, the woman should sort of crumble down, right, and uh, place her chest on her thighs and keep her behind down. So she just sort of in a heap. She's there on the ground, elbows on the ground and everything else. This is a rational, you know, argument about, you know, uh, women and the difference between women and men. However, Prophet Muhammad said, pray as you saw me pray. And that instruction was not limited to men. And it's a basic principle according to Islamic law, whether it's in the Quran or whether it's in the Sunnah. That when Prophet or Allah SWT gives instructions, and he uses male terms, in Arabic terms, addressing what appears to be addressing males, that it is applicable to both males and females unless specified otherwise. That is the general assumption. And this is the same thing actually in Arabic language. We use it when we say, Salaamu Alaikum, right? Really, this means, peace be on all you men. That's what Salaamu Alaikum means. But we use it for everybody. It's a standard. So similarly, when Prophet ﷺ said, pray as you saw me pray, it meant everybody. And in fact, when we go and see the various uh, narrations which describe the women in the Prophet's time and how they prayed, they prayed in the same way that the men prayed. Uh, the third uh, point of importance for hadith has to do with the laws, the laws of Islam, basic uh, principles which guide human lives, that in accepting the Sharia as a general guide for life, disputes must occur amongst us as human beings, we will dispute, we will uh, contradict each other, we will have arguments, we will have uh, need for resolving disputes. Well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu the judge in disputes. That his hadith would provide us with the solution for the various disputes that we might find ourselves in. Allah says in Surah An-Nisa, fourth chapter, verse 59, Ya ladina amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul wa ulil amri minkum. فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ O believers, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. If you dispute about anything, refer it to Allah and His Messenger. So referring the uh, disputes to Allah and the Messenger, obviously Prophet is no longer alive, referring it to Allah meant referring it to the Quran. So, referring it to the Messenger meant referring it to Hadith. The Hadith becomes the means of resolving our uh, disputes. It becomes the, a necessary component for the smooth running of the legal system in the Muslim state. Now, the fourth uh, importance of hadith is that it forms what may be called the moral ideal that is since prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was guided in his day-to-day -day life in how he interacted with people because people would observe him and take uh, from his character, from his behavior, from his treatment of 
his wives, children, etc., other people, neighbors, etc. They would take from his behavior uh, guidelines for their own behavior. Therefore, his hadith provided uh, a body of moral principles by which to guide and develop uh, human moral character. And uh, when, on one occasion, his wife Aisha radiallahu anha was asked about his conduct, what was his character like, what was the character of the Prophet ﷺ like, she asked the questioner if that questioner had not read the Qur'an. And the individual said, yes, I read the Qur'an. And she said, that was his character. His character was the Qur'an. He practically demonstrated in his lifestyle how the Qur'an was to be implemented. The fifth uh, importance or point of importance is related to the preservation of Islam itself. In that the hadith and the science which developed around it, a science which was unknown to worlds prior, this science became a means of preserving Islam itself. We know that the messages which came to the former prophets السلام, whether it is Jesus, Moses, Abraham or Adam that these messages became distorted as time passed as generations came changes took places in these messages so the overall system of Islam which was taught by those prophets became lost in time Bits and pieces may have remained, but the overall message was no longer uh, the message which was originally brought. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, had said in Surah Al Hijr, 15th chapter, verse 9, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. Indeed, I have revealed the reminder and I will indeed protect it. So, through the science of hadith, the body of Islamic law, knowledge, practice uh, was preserved through the science of hadith itself. So, we can say in terms of the importance of hadith, that their relevance to revelation itself in that hadith was a form of revelation and that it should be treated as such was the first importance. Secondly, that it clarified the meanings and preserved and protected the meanings of the Quran. Thirdly, that it was the necessary uh, means of resolving disputes and uh, explaining how the legal system of Islam should be implemented. Fourthly, that it provided the moral ideal about which Prophet Muhammad had said, "Inna ma I was only sent to perfect for you the highest of moral character traits, in which. That statement of his, he summarized the essence of Islam, the message of Islam, as being a moral message calling to morality, morality with regards to God, first and foremost, which meant worshipping God alone and not worshipping others besides him or along with him. Uh, morality with, re with regards to our fellow human beings and to ourselves, how we treat ourselves, how we treat fellow human beings, there are guidelines there. Uh, we shouldn't steal, we shouldn't cheat, etc., etc., lie. And with regards to the 
rest of creation which Allah has submitted to us there is moral behavior guidelines of moral behavior Prophet Muhammad had said we should not make any animals our targets that is we just go and kill animals for sport and for fun you know that we have a responsibility to look after them to take care of them Prophet Muhammad on one occasion had said that a woman went to paradise because of a dog and a man went to hell because of a cat or another woman, some other narrations, a woman went to hell because of a cat in the case of the one going to hell it was because the fact that she had a cat which she did not look after she tied it up, didn't allow it a chance to feed itself and it starved to death so Allah put her in hell because of it and, and in the case of a dog uh, a woman going to paradise, a woman who was from the children of Israel and who was actually a, had come out of a, a life of prostitution she had come to a well, gone in and got some water, came back out and found a dog outside panting out of thirst it was uh, at such great thirst that it began even to lick the earth to try to get some kind of moisture around the well and she climbed back down in the well, filled her shoe with water, brought it back and fed the dog and because of that Prophet said you know, she was placed by Allah in paradise <coughs> So the moral message is central to Islam and finally we said that the, in terms of important hadith that it provided a means of preserving the system of Islam as a whole not only did it preserve the Quran, uh, the meanings of the Quran etc it also preserved the whole system of practices and that science which evolved, this is what really preserved it the hadith itself created due to the need of conveyance of the hadith accurately it created or Allah brought forth people who developed a science in order to ensure its authenticity and in doing that they inadvertently also protected the authenticity of the Islamic teachings as a whole I mean they were not themselves thinking that we are going to protect the Islamic teachings as a whole you know that is a so something of a you know a kind of an arrogant position to take no they were just concerned about trying to protect the hadith but in fact through them Allah had the whole system protected now as I mentioned uh, initially do you want to turn the condition on this point as I mentioned initially that there is a relationship between the hadith and the sunnah one which leads myself and leads other people to uh, to use the terms interchangeably in fact the terms are different in meaning because we said hadith meant for, uh, primarily hadith meant uh, the speech the sayings uh, actions and approvals of the Prophet Sallam, whereas sunnah actually meant way or path way or path and in the science of hadith the term sunnah really is indistinguishable from hadith it means one and the same thing it includes uh, not only saying acts and approval but also includes uh, physical uh, descriptions of the Prophet and it includes information prior to the prophethood whereas when it's used in a legal sense in the field of fiqh, in usul al-fiqh sunnah only refers to the statements, acts and approvals of the Prophet you know, which had uh, legal import which was related to the religion in specific right? because uh, in general uh, there may be some statements of the Prophet Muhammad where he expressed his own personal uh, preferences whether it had to do with the foods he ate or certain types of clothing that he wore uh, these are not considered a part of the legal body in Islam except to say that it just indicates the general permissibility of people to eat whatever they want to eat you know if there are foods to be discussed you know, if somebody says, can we eat this or can we, can we not eat this? You know, people have asked, for example, you know, there are some parts of the world where people eat monkey's brains, right? 
you know, some practice of, uh, uh, and, the, and the brain of the monkey whilst it's alive. In fact, you know, uh, is this uh, permissible? I was asked this question. So my response was basically that it was permissible. And they were asking me, well, what's the proof that it's permissible? You know, why? Because this thing sounds so horrible. So, you know, how could it possibly be permissible for us to eat monkeys' brains, you know? But the point is that when it comes to foods, the general principle is that they are all permissible except what has been specifically prohibited. So, so when an issue comes up about food, we have to, and somebody wants, wants to say, well, it's not permissible, that is the person who is required to bring the evidence not the person who uh, chooses to eat it because for example you know in Germany people will eat uh, meat steak they'll eat steak raw you know literally they take the steak they throw it on the pan and flip it immediately after it hit the pan in other words they're just warming the surface that's all and they eat eat it like that in Holland and in other places they eat they like to eat raw fish I mean, we can get it in the supermarkets here, you know. It's been uh, cured or whatever, but it's raw. And you have sushi of the Japanese. You know? So the point is that to say that this is haram, one has to bring evidence. Do we have any statement of Muhammad Sallallahu which said that you must cook food before eating it? You know? As you can eat raw vegetables, you can eat raw meat if that's what you choose. So. What you don't like, or what we personally don't like, we can't make halal and haram on the basis of it. And the actions of the Prophet Muhammad uh, demonstrated that you know uh, these things are left up to individuals. Now, when we, uh, as I said, when we look at the the Sunnah and the Hadith with regards to uh, Sunnah having legal importance um, there is a um, problem of uh, arrangements in that the number of women here are far more than the number of men. <laughs> and this is our usual, uh, usual thing, you know, um, that we do need to shift things around to give them some more room. So perhaps we can stop here for a minute and allow people to just shift things. <laughs> Just to repeat the um, distinction that we were making between the hadith and the sunnah. We said that from the point of view of the science of hadith, the terms sunnah and hadith are interchangeable. Uh, linguistically speaking, there are differences in the meaning, hadith meaning conversation, whereas sunnah meaning way or path. Right? That in the technical sense, both of them refer to the sayings, actions, and approvals of the Prophet along with descriptions of his physical uh, nature as well as even biographical information about himself whereas in the science of Islamic law usul al-fiqh what we find is that uh, the sunnah refers primarily to the sayings actions and approvals of the Prophet which have legal import and it is used also in the legal sense to distinguish between uh, the Sharia 
uh, in the Sharia between what is considered innovation, bid'ah, and what is correct. They were referred to bid'ah and sunnah, sunnah and bid'ah. Sunnah being what is correct, the correct way of the Prophet and bid'ah meaning uh, innovations. And it is also used in the uh, rules governing human acts. It is the term also used to refer to those acts which are classified as being recommended. The other terms used are mustahab, mandub, and others. Uh, sunnah is used here to indicate what is recommended. <clears throat> now, in general, if we look at the sunnah as being that legal body of information to guide uh, human life, uh, explaining and providing details for us of the Sharia, then we can say that the Hadith represents the storehouse of the Sunnah or the vehicle by which the Sunnah has reached us. If we look at the Sunnah from a legal perspective, the Sunnah from a legal perspective, uh, then the hadith is what conveys to us the sunnah. Uh, that basically was the introduction to the hadith. Now, the next uh, topic, actually before going on, uh, we should look and see if there are any questions concerning hadith, understanding this foundation. However, we'll just save it uh, to the end and carry on, because we did start a bit late anyway, carry on to the next uh, topic. And let me just mention with regards to the notes that uh, hopefully, inshallah, I will have them ready for Monday's class. I would have had them ready today, except that I had a terrible accident this morning. I spilled my um, uh, fruit juice on my laptop computer, which just zapped the whole thing. So what I had been working on over the weekend was lost. I unfortunately didn't follow pro proper procedures in saving things on floppies after you work on them. So that means that I have to go and redo that material between today and Monday. <clears throat> so inshallah, hopefully I'll of course, doing it the second time is a lot easier than doing it the first time. <laughs> but um, I will prepare, finish uh, preparing the material for you and have it in the form of a spiral bound booklet uh, by Monday, inshallah. Um, I should just mention, has the um, the list of the attendees has it passed around here? Has it reached everybody? Everybody is? No. No. Signed in? no. no. Okay, so just pass it around again. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. The second uh, lecture or the second uh, part of the program deals with the compilation of hadith as we looked at the compilation of the Quran how was it gathered we will also look at the compilation of the hadith what we took out of the compilation of the Quran was assurance that the Quran was authentic that it was uh, truly from Allah and what inshallah should come out of a study of the compilation of hadith is the assurance that the hadith, what is authentic of them, we'll learn how they are authenticated, but that the hadith are also a reliable source of guidance for us as the Quran is a reliable source. Quran is a primary source. The hadith is also a primary. Though it may be secondary to the Quran, 
It is the Quran and the Hadith together which form our foundation, two primary sources. So, uh, if we look to the era of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to determine where this process of Hadith compilation began, we find that the Prophet Sallallahu did not leave a lot of instructions for the compilation of hadith as in fact he didn't leave stated instructions for the Quran though he practically uh, gathered around him scribes who instructed to write down the Quran so he practically took the steps necessary to preserve it in terms of the hadith we do find uh, a narration which is found in Sahih Muslim in which uh, Prophet Sallallahu had forbidden the writing down of hadith and he said whoever wrote other besides the Quran they should erase it there is a statement of this nature and from that it was generally concluded that the Sahaba in the lifetime of Prophet Sallallahu they did not do any writing because of the Prophet Sallallahu given this instruction. However, this instruction was to preserve the Quranic text from interpolation. That is, those who were writing down the Quran were to avoid writing hadith along with it so that they may not inadvertently work their way into the Quran because if we actually look at the instructions of Prophet Sallallahu with regards to uh, in, uh, writing we do find on many occasions he did write things down which are from his hadith he, he wrote letters which he sent to governors in different uh, of the rulers of different nations etc and to his governors in different provinces etc we find that he did in fact record statements which were these were hadith whatever he said he dictated and they wrote it down these were hadith and these were recorded and sent out so in practice we find that the recording of hadith did take place many times in terms of instructions concerning taxation you know the, the zakah etc you know information this information had to be distributed and much of it was distributed in writing and there is uh, a number of, of recorded statements of the companions that they did in fact record wrote down hadith in the lifetime of Prophet Sallallahu among the most notable is one by Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As he said I used to write down everything which I heard from the Messenger of Allah with the intention of memorizing it. However, some Qurayshites forbade me from doing so, saying, Do you write everything that you hear from him? While the Messenger of Allah is a human being who speaks in anger and pleasure. So, Abu Dhabi ibn Amr used to write down everything that uh, he heard from the Prophet ﷺ with this intention of memorizing. However, he was discouraged from doing so by some people from the tribe of Quraysh who were originally from Mecca. They advised him, shouldn't do that because Prophet ﷺ was a human being and sometimes he said things which were from himself in anger or sometimes he said things, you know, uh, inadvertently, uh, for things which pleased him, which were personal things. So, Abdullah ibn Amr said, so I stopped writing and I mentioned it to the Messenger of Allah and the Prophet ﷺ pointed to his mouth and said, write by him in whose hands is my soul only truth comes out of it. And this is an authentic hadith, it can be found in Sunan Abi Dawood, authenticated. So, here is a clear instruction of the Prophet ﷺ to his companion to continue to do what he was doing, writing down everything. Also, Abu Huraira narrated that when Mecca was conquered, 
the Prophet ﷺ stood up and gave a sermon. And in the narration, Abu Huraira mentions the sermon. Then a man from Yemen by the name of Abu Shah, he got up and said, O Messenger of Allah, write it down for me. A sermon. And the Messenger of Allah said, write it down for Abu Shah. Okay, this is the whole sermon that the Prophet ﷺ gave. Actually, in the narration, it says, uh, Al Walid was one of the narrators. He asked Abu Amr, what were they writing? And he said it was the sermon that they heard that day. So the whole sermon represents hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And here he is instructing them to write it down for Abu Shah, who was from Yemen. He was going back to Yemen. He wanted that body of information to take back with him. Another narration, uh, Abu Qabil said, we were with Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, and he was asked which city would be conquered first, Constantinople or Rome. So Abdullah called for a sealed trunk and said, take out the book from it. There's a book in it, take it out. Then Abdullah said, while we were with the Messenger of Allah writing, the Messenger of Allah said, what, sorry, the Messenger of Allah was asked, which city would be conquered first, Constantinople or Rome? So Allah's Messenger said, the city of Heraclius will be conquered first, meaning Constantinople. The conquest of Rome has yet to come. Uh, anyway, the point is that during the lifetime of the Prophet Wasallam, a number of his traditions, his hadiths, were written down. In fact, uh, the major narrators of hadith, the vast majority of the major narrators of hadith, themselves wrote down hadith. Though it is traditionally you know, understood that it was conveyed orally, you know, and, and oftentimes people speak about the prodigious memories of the Arabs, you know, and this became the focus why we can still be assured that it was preserved because of their memory. The fact of the matter is that many of them wrote and we can find uh, narrations uh, ascribing writing to the vast majority of those who narrated hadith. And um, if we look at the, 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 the mass of hadith literature which has come to us, the total number of those who actually uh, narrated hadiths is someplace around 1,060 of the companions. And the total number of companions was far beyond that. And those who narrated more 20 hadiths or more, their total number was only like 120 something. So the majority of those who narrated hadith, say 500, nearly half of those who, who narrated hadith, he said 1,060 of them narrated hadith, 500 of them only narrated one hadith. So uh, the idea, you know, which people raise about, you know, this hadith being narrated and how it might have been forgotten, etc. I mean, if you only have one hadith to narrate, <laughs> you know. I mean, you don't need a prodigious memory to, to uh, remember that one hadith. Anyway, the point, as I said, is that writing took place in the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself. There's clear evidence, and I mentioned all these hadiths where uh, this was known to take place. In the era of the Sahaba, that is, after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu now the issue of writing down his sayings and, act, act, and, and actions took on major importance. During his lifetime, it was not that important because of the fact that he was there. They could always go back to him. They could you know, ask whatever they needed to ask. He was around. He was available. Now he was no longer there. Now the need to have his statements, his actions, his approvals available to those who 
who are now conveying Islam to the next generation, this now became a critical issue. In fact, at the death of the Prophet Sallam, the Sahaba debated as to where they should bury him. Where we should be buried? Should we bury him in Al Baqiyah, the graveyard of Medina? Or should we bury him in his masjid? Or where should we bury him? And it wasn't until Abu Bakr quoted for them a statement of the Prophet in which he said, Prophets should be buried wherever they die. That that conflict was resolved. So they went into the bedroom of Aisha, they lifted up where his bed was, and they dug his grave right there and buried him. Of course, some of you may not be familiar with that, and you, what you know is that the Prophet's grave is in his masjid. <laughs> you know, you might be wondering, what am I saying here? Because right? I said he was buried in the Aisha's house. The fact of the matter is that Aisha's house was not a part of the masjid in the time of Prophet nor was it inside of the masjid during the time of the righteous caliphs. But it was, you know, years after their time that one of the Umayyad governors, you know, made the decision to expand the masjid and include the house of Aisha. And that's how his grave ended up within the masjid. And in fact, this was not his instruction. In fact, he forbade the building of masjids over graves. He forbade that outright. It's really not permissible to have a grave in a masjid. Huh? So this was uh, going against actually, in fact, the actual teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Anyway, just to mention, you know, some of the uh, other companions of the Prophet Sallallahu you know, we find who uh, wrote down hadith. We have Abu Huraira, who is looked at as being the most prolific narrator of hadith. And when you see the numbers that are used to refer to hadith narrators, and I'll mention, for example, the top 12, Abu Huraira is 5,374, Ibn Omar is 2,630, Anas ibn Malik is 2,286, Aisha bint Abi Bakr is 2,210, that is Aisha was the fourth most prolific narrator of hadith. Uh, then we have Ibn Abbas, 1,660, Jabir ibn Abdullah, 1,540, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, 1,170, Ibn Mas'ud, 748, uh, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, 700, Umar ibn al-Khattab, 537, Ali ibn Abi Talib, 536, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, 360, Al-Barra ibn Azib, 305. These are the top 12 right, narrators. What we find is that Abu Huraira, when we talk about these numbers of narrations of hadith, again, people mistakenly think that these are the actual number of hadith which he narrated. However, what, what this really refers to is the number of channels through which the hadith was transmitted. The number of channels through which the hadith was transmitted. Meaning, Abu Huraira quotes a hadith of Prophet Muhammad and I will be giving you a chart so you can look at hadith and how they were transmitted. He had a number of students. Say 10 of his students listened to this uh, presentation, this uh, transmission. They learned this hadith and they passed it on. Each of these students themselves had ten other students or five other students and from them they were recorded in the final set of books of hadith uh, recording right? each book which has a channel of narration of that particular hadith this is called one of the channels of narration and these are what are actually uh, met when they say that Abu Huraira narrated 5,374. It's actually, there are 5,374 channels of narration of his hadith. When uh, modern research actually looked at the 
actual hadith themselves which were narrated, removing all of the repetition, they found that the total number of hadith narrated by Abu Huraira were in fact 1,236, almost 50% of the actual figure which was commonly circulated. As I said, these were really channels of narration as opposed to separate and individual hadiths. Anyway, Abu Huraira was reported by Hassan ibn Amr at Damari to have had books. And he said, Damari said, I saw books in his possession. And Abdullah ibn Abbas he used to write down whatever he heard and he even had slaves who he employed who had the skill of writing who would also record the hadith for him. Amr ibn al-As, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As who we mentioned earlier, uh, he was known to have recorded books of hadith in the time of the Prophet and his major collection was known as As-Sahifa As-Sadiqa. As-Sahihah, sorry, as sahiha as sahiha as or some notion as uh, Anyway, his compilation was known, scholars of the early times spoke about it. It hasn't come down to our times, it's no longer, it's not available. Uh, similarly, Abu Bakr, who was the first caliph, he was known to have written down over 500 sayings of the Prophet <coughs> The, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad not only wrote down hadiths during the lifetime of the Prophet وسلم, they continued to write them down after the time of the Prophet وسلم, after his death they shared the hadith amongst themselves the younger ones, people like uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas Abdullah ibn Umar you know, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As all these were younger companions of the Prophet وسلم, and they used to uh, sit with the older companions and gather hadith from them and they would record them. <clears throat> now just a point to note that when we use the term Sahaba or companions that this refers to anyone who met Prophet Muhammad وسلم, a believer and died a believer. Right? This is the general definition of the Sahaba. Because there were people who lived in his lifetime, lived during the time of his life, but never met him. They were in other parts of the world, they were in Yemen, etc. They were contemporaries of his, but they never met him. These are not considered or classified as Sahaba or companions. Companion doesn't necessarily mean somebody who narrated information. I mean, narrated were narrators amongst the companions and were not necessarily themselves uh, each and every one of them did not necessarily have to narrate <clears throat> the third era is that of the tabi'un and this is in the first century this is still all within the first century of the hijra right from migrated to medina and at the time of his migrati- migration be- began the Hijraic calendar. You know, Omar ibn al-Khattab is the one who designated it as the point by which time would be uh, observed, uh, our years, etc. And the Sahaba, of course, most of them lived during that first century. Uh, and those who were their students came to be known as the tabi'un or the successors or the followers they were the students of the sahaba and they conveyed the information which the sahaba conveyed from the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi they conveyed it to the next generation they studied under the sahaba and gathered that information they traveled to different parts of the Muslim realm, wherever the Sahaba were, they sat with them. Uh, although in the initial stages, uh, those people who were in the areas of the Sahaba, they just sat with those who were in their area. And it's really the generation after them that a lot of traveling took place. Anyway, 
The point is that uh, during the era of, of Omar and Uthman, Islam spread all across North Africa. It spread up into Turkey and into Persia. And the Sahaba went with the, the armies and they settled in some of these places. And they would teach the Sunnah of the Prophet to the people as they accepted Islam or to other Muslims who, whose knowledge of Islam was limited. They would teach, they took on the job, a number of them took on the job of conveying Islam to people of their vicinity, of the area and location where they lived. So, those who stayed and studied under them were referred to as the Tabi'un, they said the successors. And they uh, were themselves involved in the writing process just as the Sahaba were. We can find, for example, if we look at the top 12 companions, we find Abu Huraira, nine of his students were known to have recorded hadiths from him. In fact, one of his students, Hammam ibn al munabbi he, his والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنة يوم الدين I praise you to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day this is the first in our series this week of uh, studies in hadith, hadith literature, the science of hadith, referred to as ulum al-hadith, and uh, we will be looking at a number of different topics uh, related to hadith and the science as a second step from what was covered on the second level of our uh, intensive courses uh, which we began a year ago last summer summer of uh, 2000 at that time we did an introduction to the science of hadith now we're continuing on with further detail of course some of you were not present in the first course, so of necessity some of the points will have to be uh, reviewed. The science, or the science of hadith, based on the, the term hadith itself, an Arabic term, which basically means an item of news, conversation, a tale, a story or a report, whether historical or legendary, whether true or false, relating to the past or the present. This is the general meaning uh, linguistically. However, in the same way that other words prior to the final revelation changed meaning in Arabic, like words like zakah, salah, these had other meanings prior to the prophethood. And it was with the prophethood that these uh, words took on new meanings, the meanings that we know now. Similarly, the term hadith 
took on a particular meaning uh, with the uh, development of Islam. Now, we find the term hadith used in both the Quran and the Sunnah. And it has been used to mean uh, the same general usages linguistically as in uh, Surah Al-Qalam verse 44 we have Allah saying there then leave me alone with those who reject this communication and the term used here فَذَرْنِي وَمَنْ يُكَذِّبُ بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ the term hadith is used there and it's taken to mean communication and this obviously it's referring here to the Quran and we find